Welcome back to Drumming Through the Decades. The 1960s was a big decade, both when it came to politics, fashion and attitudes. Music is always a commentary of the times, so we saw an emergence of new genres being created. People started to use music and television as a political instrument. Some of the key styles emerging were soul, folk and protest songs, as well as rock and blues, all with different subgenres. We also saw some incredible female artists and drummers. My name is Vicky O'Neon, I'm a drummer and educator. In this episode, we're heading into the 1960s, which was an unforgettable decade when it comes to the evolution of music. Vicky O'Neon presents Drumming Through the Decades. Music, we see yet another popular music genre that originated in African American communities throughout the United States, starting in the 1950s into the 1960s. It combines elements of African American gospel music, rhythm and blues, and jazz. Record labels like Motown, Atlantic, and Stax also played an important role in the civil rights movement. Motown started as a Detroit-based record label and became hugely popular worldwide. Motown Records consisted mainly of African-American groups, singers, songwriters, and managers. Thanks to their musical and business success, they played a huge role in breaking down the barriers of segregation and granted African-American performers and musicians a chance to reappropriate much of the success that had been credited to white rock and roll and pop artists who had successes in singing black music during the 50s. Diana Ross and the Supremes was one of the most influential groups to come out of the Motown sound and they had as much chart success as any of the rock genres that dominated the airwaves during the 60s. The success of Motown also paved the way for other soul singers and groups to enjoy mainstream success. Some other popular artists include Marvelettes, Martha and the Vandellas, the Ronettes, Aretha Franklin, Nina Simone, and Dusty Springfield. So let's head over to my studio and we'll have a little look at the rhythmic characters of Motown. There's many different grooves that came out of Motown, so it's difficult to say this is the Motown beat because there's so many different variations. But this one that I'm going to show you now definitely stands out as a typical Motown beat. So you would have the snare drum on all quarter notes and you would have fast eight notes accenting the beat. So it would be like this. One and two and three and four and one and two and three and four. And, and then the bass drum you would place on beat one and also often on beat three and and four and. So it would sound like this. So let me play along to Stevie Wonder's Uptight and demonstrate this. here that when it comes to the drum beats for soul music and R&B, it varied a lot depending on where in America the musicians were, as the US is such a vast country and the musicians would be influenced by their environments, so the beats would turn out differently as well. Like Stax Records in Memphis, Tennessee would have a different style of R&B from Motown in Detroit, Michigan, and soul musicians from the South like Muscle Shoals in Alabama would again have a different sound. So do go and check out these different drum beats and sub-genres. The British Invasion also began around 1963 with the arrival of the Beatles and other amazing British bands that were influenced by American blues, rockabilly, soul and rock and roll. 
As these bands gained popularity, many of them ventured into new music territory and created their own unique style that they brought back into America. A key event was the Beatles appearing on the Ed Sullivan Show. And as they didn't have many TV channels at the time, about 45% of all TVs in America was tuned in to watch the show. A new generation of teenagers called the Baby Boom Generation was looking for something to identify with and they were all glued to the screens. So overnight, Beatlemania was born and the type of fandom that followed would change the way people view and interact with music and musicians forever. So let's head over to my studio for some fun drum trivia. A whole new generation of drummers saw Ringo Starr play with the so-called match grip, which is the common grip used today. But prior to this time, most drummers would have been using what's called the traditional grip. So this goes back to the days of marching drumming, where the drum was leaning, so you had to create a grip where you could easily play the drum. So then, when the drum set was invented and evolved, most drummers just left their snare on a slant. Occasionally you could see drummers switch to the match grip if they needed to hit harder, but it was not the default grip until the Beatles performed at the Shia Stadium in 1965 for 55,000 people. And this was the first time ever in history that a band had performed to an audience this size. And at that time, the PA systems were so much smaller than today, and there was a huge audience, especially filled with loads of teenage girls screaming their lungs out. So Ringo decided to use the match grip so he could hit the drums really hard to cut through the audience. So overnight, Ludwig Drum Company, who also invented the bass drum pedal and the first drum kit, they saw an explosion in sales due to their endorsement of Ringo Starr. The Beatles quenched the desire for new, hard-hitting, danceable music with electric instruments and overnight the drum set became a sought-after instrument and the blueprint for the style. And the match grip now also becomes the default grip, which is still the most commonly used grip today amongst drummers. And the drum kit hasn't really evolved much since this era. We now have the kick drum, snare, toms from high to low, we have the hi-hat, crash and ride cymbals pretty much the same way as we see them today. So let's talk about some other cool drummers from the UK. The Honeycombs were an English beat pop group founded in 1963 in North London. The group's most distinguishing mark was their female drummer Honey Lantry. And that's where the band's name came from, a combination of Lantry's nickname and her job as a hairdresser. She soon became the main attraction of the group, mainly because she was an amazing drummer, but also a great vocalist. At age 21, she had become the first woman drummer to play on a number one chart topper, Have I the Right, released in June 1964. The drums carry an important part of the song, and their effect was further enhanced by members of the band stamping their feet on wooden chairs in the studio. Other female drummers from the UK in the 1960s included London native Tina Amos of the British pop group The Ravens. She was 16 when she joined the band and their most famous song was I Just Wanna Hear You Say I Love You. We also had Sylvia Sanders from the Liverbirds, a band from Liverpool that reached huge success in Germany. We also had East London based band The Mission Bells who had two drummers, Lorraine Hall and Laureen Brown. Drummer Chrissy Lee is a powerhouse, not to be left out, who is still actively drumming and teaching in the UK today. She's been drumming practically her whole life and joined the Salvation Army at age four. She has played with some of the music industry's most celebrated artists and in 1963, Chrissy and her band The Beat Chicks supported the Beatles on their first tour in Spain. In 2020, she joined Britain's Got Talent with a jaw-dropping audition aired on national television. I feel super honored to have been playing alongside her and other incredible drummers in this year's Drumathon Live 2021 to raise money for mental health. Baby, baby. 
heading back to the US, we had Goldie and the Gingerbreads, who was the first all-female pop band signed to a major record label. The drummer in the band, Ginger Bianco, ran away from home at age 17 to pursue a career as a musician. When she met Goldie the singer at Trudy Heller's club in New York, it was like a match made in heaven. Most female bands, though, were ignored by the big record labels at the time, and many women hadn't ventured into the world of rock because of the heavily masculine connotation to the style. So Goldie and the Gingerbreads were amongst the first to break into a domain dominated by men. The second band to receive a major record deal was the Pleasure Seekers, an all-female rock band from Detroit, Michigan. The original lineup included lead singers Susie Quattro and Patty Quattro, with Nancy Ball on drums, guitarists Mary Lou Ball and Diane Baker on piano. In 1968, they became one of the earliest all-female rock bands to sign with a major label, Mercury Records, and charted with both their singles, Light of Love and Good Kind of Hurt. There are many subgenres to rock with their own unique style and purpose, and many are still popular today. Many rock bands and musicians experimented to find their own true sound, and they often fall into more than one category, and it's up for the debate amongst their fans what genre they best represent. Surf rock began in Southern California as a type of dance music that was mostly instrumental and it became quite popular in the early to mid 60s. Let's head over to my studio and I'll show you a surf rock beat. So the surf rock beat is directly influenced by rock and roll and is a catchy beat that people quickly caught on to. The first time you heard this beat was in a tune by The Ventures called Walk Don't Run. Okay, so we're playing straight eighth notes on the right cymbal and the kick drum is playing on beat one and three. And the key part of the beat is what's happening in the snare drum where we're accenting beat two, two and and four. One and two. So now with surf rock, you can clearly see how we're moving away from the shuffle triplet feel and we're doing a straight feel, which came to characterize so much of rock music. Oh, and you just had some kind of Psychedelic rock was popular during the later half of the 1960s and along with folk rock became two of the most recognizable sounds associated with the 1967's Summer of Love phenomenon. Psychedelic music was created with the intention of enhancing the experience of listeners who were using mind-altering substances and there was much experimentation in the sound, often influenced by Eastern and Indian music. As with soul music and all other styles that starts to emerge, it's actually difficult to break down one specific drum part that fits everything under that style. And that's especially true for psychedelic rock, where part of the genre was to experiment to find your own unique sound. I thought I'd give you a little demonstration anyways of Jefferson Airplane's song, Somebody to Love, with the amazing Grace Slick on vocals. They performed it at the legendary Woodstock Festival in 1969, and it has the same drive from the Motown beat with the quarter notes on the snare. Rock took the elements of rock and roll and made them heavier and the genre formed in the middle of the decade. The sound is characterized by more aggressive tones and delivery and the vocalists are identified by their higher range and often raspy voices. The style became associated with rebellious youth and anti-authority behavior with a few acts even destroying their own instruments on stage like The Who. Due to their hard partying lifestyles, many musicians that were a part of the hard rock scene developed drug and alcohol problems. 
As a result of these problems, quite a few influential musicians died at a young age, like the incredible legend Janis Joplin. One of the first albums I bought was by Janis Joplin. I've been hugely inspired by her ever since. So I'm going to be playing a little snippet of Peace of My Heart for you. the 1960s without mentioning Mo Tucker, the drummer from Velvet Underground, which was another epic rock band formed in New York City in 1964. The band was managed by Andy Warhol. Maureen Ann Mo Tucker was asked to join the band in 1965 and her unconventional style of playing came to define the sound of the band, keeping the music rooted in traditional rock rhythms, while other members overlaid abstract lyrical images, feedback and other sound textures. And she rarely used symbols. She felt like the purpose of a drummer was simply to keep time and symbols were unnecessary for this purpose and drowned out the other instruments. Tucker gives credits to blues artist Bo Diddley and Nigerian drummer Babatundi Olatunki as main inspirations for her play. Their debut album, The Velvet Underground and Nico, is considered by Rolling Stone to be the most prophetic rock album ever made. Mo was an incredible driving force in one of the most important bands in the history of rock and roll. Some also say that her greatest contribution was inspiring the idea of women as instrumentalists into the collective rock and roll consciousness. Thank you, Mo Tucker. So that was it for the 1960s. In the next episode, we will learn more about women who rock. We will also learn about disco, funk, hard rock, and punk. Thank you so much for watching. Do you have any fun trivia from this decade? I would love to hear it, so please comment below. And also make sure to subscribe to my channel to not miss the next episode. I see you then.